That is good. Am I on? Okay. All right. All right. Um, seems like I haven't spoken for a while, just one week. But uh, um, uh, today's message, as I prayed about it and uh, praying and preparing, I sense a special importance to the word because I believe I'm not only pre preaching, but I'm also declaring something in the heavenlies. Let me begin by something very fundamental. When Jesus came and came to public, began to share, preach the gospel, this is what he said. The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And, and, and then when he went, wherever he went, he did three things. He proclaimed, he pre preached the gospel. Secondly, he healed the sick. Third, he cast out demons. And this casting out demons, we often do not talk as much about in the churches these days. But I realize as I look at the gospel, word of God, his message was, kingdom of God is here. The new king is here. The old rule has to go. Old authority has to go. This is why when he came, people are being healed. Because the sickness and death, those are part of the old kingdom. When he came, this is why demons from the first, when he began to preach, demons will show up and will say, Son of the Most High God, why are you here to torment us? He's been saying that all the time because he, the gospel is not only did he come as a savior, he came as a king. He's a king, you know, the original, you know, the, uh, the Lord of the Ring, right? The king, he came back. That's the gospel. The king has come. Kingdom of God is coming, has come. He'll fully come when he returns, and he has come. King is here. All rules, all authority must go. There was a season even in At Hope Church, some years ago, there was a season where a heightened spiritual sense of authority and sense of presence where we saw on Sunday services people being freed. And we, I saw people actually in and actually out on the field playing softball, and they see some of their friends will be having a manifestation where they, they, we got to cast out demons. A sort of season where we saw this normally, God has awakened us this is something that I know is, can be scary, to, you know, and it is not a scary thing. It is a normal thing. And so I want to declare this in heavenly places. And, you know, and so today's, so today's account in the Gospel of Luke, as you know, we are going through the Gospel of Luke. I started with Luke last year and at Christmas time, Luke 2. Now we are ending, we are still in the midst of Luke chapter 8. There's only 24 chapters. We have probably three more years to go to finish Luke, okay? We'll do this, okay. Anyhow, the today's account is really a second part of the last account, which where Jesus, you know, rebuked the wind and the waves and calmed the ocean and the waves. This is the second part of the story. And I have seen this passage so many times, but as I went and looked back at what God was saying, I was so blessed and amazed. I see something that I didn't see there before. And you will be amazed as well. Before I go on, before I pray and begin, let me ask. Have you ever had any uh, spiritual encounters? We can call it demonic, we can, any encounters? Was it scary? Was it normal? Hopefully not. Or was it scary? And I want to let you know it is not something scary. It is something that we are supposed to understand. We are supposed to stand firm in God. Okay? Okay, and, and let's pray. Father, we just come in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, the King, the Savior, and the Lord. For this reason, also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him name above, which is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, everything in heavens, on earth, and under the earth will bow their knees. And that every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We come today, God, Father, I pray right now, you'll grant us not only understanding 
of the truth, but we ask we may see your face, O oh God. We may know you, love you. Father God, your truth will set us free. We give you glory, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. The story really is, let me just give a quick summary. story is, Jesus comes to the other side of the lake, or the Sea of Galilee, on the eastern side where, you know, the Gentiles, mostly Gentiles live. He comes over there and meets a man, a crazy man, had many, many demons in him. Jesus set this man free. This is the story. And the name of the demon was, you know, demons, they called themselves legion. This is the story we're going to look at. I want to slowly look at this account, and I want to take time to explain it a little bit, sort of like a Bible study type of way, but I want us to come back and apply it into our life, what God is saying to us. If you can open your Bible, and, and you know, and, well, I, I, the physical Bible I like better, but if, we, if you are using your phone, that's fine. We're going to look at ESP, we also have words on the screen as well. Look at um, Luke chapter 8, verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of Gerasenes. Some Bible will say Gadarenes. And some places would call Gergasenes. But in there, in our, so there are different translations. Which is opposite, which is, which is opposite Galilee. And Jesus has stepped out on land. There met him a man from the city who had demons. I want you to notice it's a demon, not one demon, demons, plural, okay? And you know, this is not the only case. There were other places in the Bible where people had more than one demon. Remember the, uh, was it the woman, uh, seven demons. What was her name? Ah. Come on. Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene had seven demons in her. Right. For a long time he had worn nothing. No clothes. Naked, book, naked running around. And he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. Let me stop here before I go on. There's something here I didn't see this. Do you remember the story account that I shared two weeks ago in the, in the, in the park? Jesus said after teaching all day long, Jesus said, let's go to the other side of the lake. He said, he didn't, without saying why, he said, let's go to the other side. When he got to the boat, got into the boat, he fell asleep. And on the way, the wind and the storms come, remember? And one of the things I remember noticing was, and Jesus wakes up and he rebukes the wind. He rebukes the wind. The word rebukes is, the word is used but when he casts the demons. So he rebukes the wind and calms the ocean. And he, now, it's now this boat arrives on the other side. Do you, do you see there's something happening here? Jesus was, Jesus planned to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. For this one man, one man, demonized man, this man has been suffering for many, many years, running around naked. If you look at down the line in places, he was screaming and living by the tombs, and he was with the stone, he would be scraping himself, he's harming himself. This is a man who was totally tormented. That one man, Jesus, took time to go to find that one man. You'll find the story in the down the line. That's all he went for. He comes back after that. He went out, Jesus went out for one hurting, broken person. Almost like the story of that woman in Samaritan woman at Sika, right? Who, who was who had many husbands, who was oh, you know, lonely. She was, she came to you know through the water from the well when nobody would come. As if Jesus, Jesus, literally the Bible says, he said he had to go through Samaria purposefully for that one woman. Here you find Jesus going to the other side of the Galilee for one tormented man. Why? Because Jesus said he is, he came, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's what he came to do. Seek and save the law. She will stop everything for one person, one broken person, one lonely, hurting person. That is our God. Amen? Isn't that good? I didn't know that. I didn't see this. Uh, and often I read chunks of the passages to not connect it well. I realized he was going other side so that he will treat that man. Now that makes sense why Jesus rebuked the wind. 
I'm wondering why, whether demonic forces were trying to stop him from going out there. Does it make sense? And so this is what I see here. And because in, 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 in and uh, um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I have the PowerPoint for this, but in Mark, Mark's account, Mark chapter 5, verse 3 to 5, it says, and no one was able to bind him anymore. Even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. He was tormented. He had supernatural power. He had power to break up the iron chains and shackles, and broke him and came out. Nobody can bound him. So they drove him away. Constantly night and day he was screaming, screaming all night long among the tombs. He's in torment and in the mountains gashing himself with stones. And this is what this man was tormented. He, and nobody could, nobody could bind him, nobody could help him. He had supernatural strength and power. And, and, and he was constantly screaming in pain, gashing, hurting himself, self-inflicting. You see some of the nature of demons here. And he was living among the tombs, dark places, unclean places, away from everyone, isolated. You know, in John 10, 10, 10, Jesus says, the thief, the enemy, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But the Son of Man came to give life, and life abundant. Right? Enemy came to kill and destroy steal and destroy, that's what this enemy came in. You think, this is, this is in, the, in, the, in, the, in the text. I do not know how, we do not know, it doesn't say how these demons got into him. It doesn't say. How, we do not know how the demons got into him. I personally have seen cases where demons went into people. Now, by the way, the word is very unclean here. Unclear here. I don't like the word demon possessed. Literally, Greek says demonized. Doesn't mean possession. It's a degree of influence of demons. Let's understand. Degrees of demons. That's because when you think about possession, you say, oh, I'm not possessed. This is not about me. If you see it as demons, what they call having influence in your life, this may be talking about me. There are many different you know, degrees. Remember in the beginning when Adam and Eve sinned, when Eve fell, how did Satan come? A deception, lying to and by she believing in him, listening to him, she disobeyed God. That's demonic influence in the thing. It can be influence. It can be stronghold something in your life. It can be harassment. It can be attacks. It can be oppression. It can be possession. It can be even, even manifest as sickness in your life. But we do not know. I've seen people where people got demonized many different ways. First, I've seen. One of the ways I've seen in my, in my life People get demon influenced and oppressed, harassed because of unforgiveness. I can't tell you stories after stories. I may tell you at the end of the message. And I've seen people demonized because, demon, demon oppressed and demonized because their anger. It does say in Ephesians chapter 4, be angry and yet do not sin, do not let sun go down on your anger, and do not give devil an opportunity. Anger can be a door in which demons can come into your life. We've seen that. We see people sometimes have a rage. And you know, it's, huh, this is abnormal, way beyond what people no normally do. Often the anger and rage can open up door where demons can, you give a room for demons to come in. I've seen where unforgiveness, unforgiving spirit, Spirit can be an open door. I've seen people demonized because, demon oppressed, demonized because of trauma they had. And also, one of the biggest ways demons come into our lives is by sin. Sin. This is why God is saying repent and ask God for forgiveness. Be clean so that your door will be closed. When the sin opens the door, for demons to come in into our lives and either influence whatever it might be. Now, so we do not know how he came in. Apparently, many demons came into him. Not just one, many demons came into him, he says. And, you know, and, and he, now this demon is, he is, I don't know whether it's totally demonized, but 
There's a place sometimes you see him, some sane, his thoughts coming in. When he's screaming and crying out, you see the person hurting because of demonic attacks. You can see a person wailing because you see that the, their, their pain coming out because they're being attacked. Even they're gashing themselves. You see a person, person is still, a person's person is still left in the person, even though demonic things are working in their life. Nothing to be scared of, but this is normal. Now, somebody said very, something very important. Some cultures you see demonic activities more readily. In those places, Satan works to make you fearful. So paralyzed about those things, and then you get so obsessed about it, and you, you, you actually, you are bombarded with those. So some cultures, you do not talk about it as if there's nothing there. And demons like that, Satan like that. So that you act like you did nothing happening, and yet under cover he is working in your life. It happens in both sides. This is what uh, C.S. Lewis said. There are two equal and op opposite errors, wrongs into which one race can fall about the de devils. One is disbelief in their existence, the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased, the, day, the demons are equally, themselves are pleased by both errors. Hail a materialist who disbelieves in demonic things, or magicians with same, either same delight. We need to be careful, we don't want to be you don't want to be unaware of it. On the other hand, you don't want to be excessively worried about it either. Good? Let's go on. Look at verse 28. When he saw Jesus coming, actually, let me stop here. I, I, need to, I saw something I, I noticed. You know, in the boat, the disciples are in there. You know, the Bible says, when Jesus came out, it doesn't say about disciples coming out. Only Jesus comes out as if disciples are in the back, scared. And this guy, this person sees him in a distance, he sees him, and, and he runs to him and cries out and falls down before him and says out in a loud voice, what have, you do, what have you to do with me, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I beg you to not torment me. Interesting, when Jesus comes, the demon, the demon of oppressed men realize that he is coming. And he runs, as the gospel looks at, he runs to him. Maybe this is the only Jesus came out. Everybody else is sitting in the boat. They're scared behind Jesus. Jesus comes out. This guy comes and falls before Jesus and says, what are, what, are, what are you to do with me? And he says in something interesting. You, he says, Jesus, the son of the most high God. He knew Jesus. This demonic demon being in this man knew who Jesus was. People didn't know. Disciples didn't know. You know, when, when, when Jesus calms the ocean and rebukes the wind, you know, you know the, the result was this disciples are saying, who is this man that he commands the ocean and the waves and they obey? You see? Even the disciples didn't know who Jesus really was. But demons know that Jesus, who Jesus is. From the beginning, they know who Jesus is because demons are spiritual beings. They have a lot of knowledge. More than, and they know Jesus is the son of the most high God. They know Jesus is the son of God. They know he has authority over them. Therefore, just seeing him, you're tormenting us. Why are you tormenting us? And, and so I don't want to go long in here, but I see some glimpse of things here. I see some things about demons here. They know the identity of Jesus. They have a supernatural knowledge. Okay? Now, this is why you know this is not just Psychological things is real thing going on. Secondly, they know that Jesus has authority to command them. They knew that Jesus has authority. And the people don't. He, they knew Jesus had authority. They acknowledge Jesus having authority over them. They, they, they have to obey him, whether they like it or not. And they tremble at the feet of Jesus. And you know, they also knew their destiny. Because, it, and, 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 and there you'll find, they said, Please do not send us to the abyss. The word probably do not know. Abyss comes out of Revelation, I believe, chapter 10. Talks about in the end, all the Satan and the demonic host, and finally put into abyss, the bottomless pit which is designed for them. They know their end. They are supposed to be 
put into abyss at the end of the times. They need their time, is it? Because in other gospel it says, are you tormenting it before our time? They need their destiny, their time. When I explain this, this kind of things, I, you know, I feel like I am sort of breaking the story here. Let me go back to the story. And, and, and they, and they, not just one, they cried out saying, that this is Matthew, Matthew, okay. Let me go on. Verse 29. For he had commended the unclean spirit. He's been commanding the unclean, unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it has seized, this demons has seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demons into the desert. Interesting. This, this, this is this demons. Jesus says, we're commanding them to come out. Uh, let, let me just tell a little story. I remember, this was quite a number of years ago. This is when I went on a ministry trip with Pastor, De, Pastor Bob into Korea. And on the way there, he, on the way plane, he's, in the plane, he's, he told me a prophetic words. You would have authority over seven demons. Huh. And when I was there in Korea for about 10 days, everywhere I went, I, went, I prayed, and people, demons were going out. Not just when, you know, we, some people are, leaders, but when I pray, they were manifesting things were going out. And they were not demonized you know, in fully, but there were some things were really bothering them, attacking them, and us, oppressing them in some degree. Those were going out. I seen people, and, and I, I remember I would worship in the back, just worshiping God and honoring, adoring God, and people around me about just two yards away, they're all trembling. Type demonic manifestation as if I was carrying something with me. I learned that God's presence, at God's presence, those demonic beings tremble. I learned something that I've forgotten about it for a while. Now, I, this is not my note, but let me say this. Listen carefully. This is important. This is why I'm talking about this. Very important. Okay, listen. In, in Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about when God saved us, he made us alive. Raised us up, seated us with, with Christ in the heavenly places. He seated us with Christ in the heavenly places, far above the rules of not. He has given us authority as Christian sons and daughters. This is why in Luke chapter 9, next chapter, Jesus sent the disciples out by saying, I ripped my notes, sorry. And by saying, he called the 12 together, chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, and gave them power and authority over all the demons to heal all diseases. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. Listen, this is important. Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. He has authority and power, but he gave us, the sons and daughters of God, authority over all demons and monad. And many, many, many Christians do not know who we are in God at all. We tremble at these things when God has given us authority and identity. I thought about this, right? Have you ever been caught by police by speeding? Anybody? Come on, you liars. <laughs> you know what? You know, I, I did. You know, you, know, you, know, you know, they just come in the, you know, the police outfit, right? When they come, you just shrink like, oh my, I'm trembling before this guy. You know, you, you sense the authority. They don't have to say anything, but you know, I recognize the authority as a police, and, and you know, not because they have a gun, whatever, because I see the authority. You see, what Jesus, when Jesus came, demons know who he was. He saw his authority. They trembled. This is what it is. This is our Lord, our God. He's the one who's able to, he commands the winds and the waves that will stop because he is the Lord God. Amen? The point is not only Jesus, we rescued this guy because he did it because he is the son of God. And demons knew who he was. Okay. Let me go on. Look at verse 30. And then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And, the, and, and he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. Many. And they began, they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. You see, and they asked. And other translators, other 
uh, account, other gospels say before our time. So that's what they're saying. Now, let me stop here. Legion is, is not a name. It is a term. It is a Roman military term unit consists of five to 6,000 foot soldiers and 120 horsemen and artillery and, and everything else. It's, a, it's not only a military unit. It's not just saying there are many of them. I mean, there's also a saying the legion symbolizes all the power of Roman Empire. A legion of Roman soldiers coming into a town, man, they rule everything. They have power to destroy, power over everything, power to conquer and subdue and everything. They're saying, we are legion. Saying not only we are many here, but we are powerful here. It's like 6,000 against one. There's no con contest before Jesus. It's not good and bad contest here. And they are trembling. Even though they are a legion, they are trembling before Jesus. Begs, please do not torment us. Do not command us to leave and cast us out of the places. They, they come before Jesus and beg for mercy. And, you know, and you know, people have this idea somehow good and bad is fighting. No. Not in God's economy. Evil do not have power over good before God at all. It's not God of, against Satan. No, Satan has no contest whatsoever. It is not any of those. God has power and authority over all things. And, and demons only have time, time temporal you know, authority on certain given places. And, and often because we have given them a root, foothold, foothold for those things. Interesting, the story goes on. So here you see that how Jesus is here, this demonized man naked, right? This wild looking guy with hairs everywhere, and this guy saying, and, and saying, begging Jesus. And then verse 32, now a large herd of pigs were feeding, feeding there on the hillside. And they begged them to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Now around there were pigs being raised. Now, for Jewish people, pigs are unclean. They don't raise pigs. They don't eat pigs. They don't sell pigs. But he is, you know, maybe sort of a Gentile and Jewish people mixed community here, and they're raising pigs. And pigs are unclean animals. And the demons ask, can you go into those things? When they come out of the man, has to go somewhere. And can you go into that thing where they're unclean animals? Unclean spirits saying, can you go into the unclean thing? It's just a glimpse of God's understanding why he was talking about unclean things and clean things. And in some ways, I saying, you know, we have right to get into that thing. Can you get in there, please? Jesus gave them permission. He didn't make them go. They wanted to go, and that's where they went. And then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank and into the, into the lake and drowned. 2,000 of them. 2,000 pigs, the big business. 2,000 all the demons went into pigs and they all rushed down to the hillside and they and fall and drown. So see something about the character of demons. Well, now you see that and, and you know, you know, so people ask, why did Jesus allow that? Why was Jesus, you know, harming somebody's business? I don't know all the answers, but I know a few things. Number one, Jesus is saying, that man, that tormented man is worth those 2,000 pigs and worth more. He's worth so much more than those pigs. Second thing I see here is that this is not a psychological, mental thing. This is a real thing going on here. It's a real demonic activity going on here. It's not a, his mental problem. No, there are real physical things happening, spiritual things happening, where demons actually went into the pig and pigs died. Thirdly, which is the nature of unclean spirits. Destructive, self-destroying. This is what demons are about. And, I, and the, one of the main reasons the demons hate people is that because we are created in the image of God. They hate God. Anything resembles God, they hate. That's why they hate human beings. They want human beings to have no, no resemblance of God. They want to degrade human beings. So that there will be no, you know, no resemblance of God's grace, uh, God's face at all in that. So they love to, they, you know, this is why the Bible talks about your enemy, the devil, prowls around like lion, 
roaring, roaring lion, they devour those he made. This is where we are, where we are at. And the story goes on now, she, and the pigs dies, and the, the herdsmen people are taking care of the pigs. You know, see what happened. They, they saw what happened. They fled and told it in the, in the city and the country. And he, they went back scared and tell people, you know, and about the, the pigs because they are responsible, right? And they, they told everybody what happened. And then people went out to see what happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone. He's sitting before Jesus. A sound mind. Clothed. In his right, and in, in his right mind, and when they saw this man who they could help at all for a long time, who could, they couldn't help, who was crazy for so long, they got afraid. What do you see? Transformed man. Not just demons going up, but he was transformed. In a, and, and, and he was in the right mind, the right sword in mind, and he was sitting before Jesus, not roaming around naked, not screaming in the tombs. He is sitting before Jesus, calm and, and be able to handle himself, clothed, not naked. Some, some commentators guess, whose clothes do you think he was wearing? Some this guy thought, I think probably Jesus gave his cloak to him. He would not tell, he, I don't, he thought, I don't think Jesus told the disciple, can you give him your clothes? I think he would have given him his own clothes. Put him on him. And his right mind. This is our God's desire. Not only free you, but heal you, restore you, fully be transformed into what God has made you to be. Our God is God who transforms. Not only was he set free, delivered from bondage, he was restored, healed, and transformed. That's our Lord, our God. Amen. And then it goes on to say, those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Shouldn't they be excited? Shouldn't they be happy? But instead, they are troubled. Look at that, verse 37. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them. But they were seized with great fear. Rather than saying, wow, great things, they were scared. Please, please go away. I don't know. Think about why would they have said that? And then, and they, rather than seeing the transformed man, they saw the cost it costed. 2,000 pigs. A lot of businesses being destroyed. And, and, and then, what else would he do? Please go away, please. And there was a saddest part of the story. Rather than meeting and the, the Savior who heals and restores God, who bringing God's kingdom because out of the fear, Please go away. I really don't want you here. And then, then he said, Jesus got into the boat and returned. He didn't stick around. He came for one man. One man. After all the storm and everything, he came for one man. One tormented man. He came to set free. He, I, I don't think he was a, I don't think he was a Jewish, Jewish person. I, I think he was Gentile. He came for one man to set him free. And then something beautiful goes on. The man from whom the demon had gone out begs Jesus, I, I want to be with you. Can I be with you? Jesus said, no. Sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. Rather than allowing him to come, I want you to go back home and tell people what God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. You see, this man, this demonized man, they were tormented man now being transformed. I want to be with you. I want to, can I go with you, Jesus? You love me. You rescue me. I want to be with you. And rather than Jesus saying, you can come, I said, no, I want you to go back and tell people about what God has done for you. That Gentile region will have a witness about what God has. Remember that Samaritan woman, because when she realized Jesus is Messiah, when she got saved, she went to the town, told everybody in the town, and the whole town came out to see Jesus, and they began to believe in Jesus. The same thing happens to this man. He goes and tells the people about 
what Jesus has done. And in, in other gospel it says, many were amazed what Jesus has done. Now, I'm almost done here. Almost done here. The word God has given to Hope Church this year was Isaiah 61, verse 1. And I don't know how many of you remember this. I've been praying this thing so often. Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring goodness to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and then to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. That's what Jesus came to do. He is the Messiah, anointed one. He came to set the captive free, liberty to the captives. That's who he is. See, in this, in this account, what I see is that by what he's doing, people, people said, who then is this man? He commands the seas and oceans, and they obey. Now they're saying, who then is this man who commands even the host of demons, and they obey? He's not just a man. He is the Messiah, the Son of God. That's what this passage is talking about. He is the Son of God, mighty God. I asked this, uh, yesterday Daniel to begin the praise with when he walks into the room. Listen carefully. When he walks into the room, Daniel, can you come up? Can you, can you put the words up? When he, come, when he walks into the room, what happens? Can you put the words up for this praise? When he walks into the room, everything changes. Darkness starts to tremble. And at the light of his, well, he brings light of his presence. You know, I grew up in Hawaii, right? One of the things Hawaii is, Hawaii is proud of is big cockroaches. This big, okay? And, and you know, when, they, when, when, and when it's damp, when it's raining, they fly, they look this big. You know, and, and when you step on it, crack. And the white guts come out. You know, at night when you go out, right, when you turn the light on, they're all scurrying away. When you turn the lights on, they all run away. Listen, when the light comes in, darkness, please. When Jesus, our Lord God, comes in our midst, the darkness has to go. Amen? This is why when he walks into the room, darkness trembles. When he walks into the room, the sick get healed. When he walks into the room, broken get healed when he walks in the room the bound gets set free when he walks into the room amen that's our god that's our god and we do not know that we forgot to be oh he's just this loving god he loves me we forgot who he really was who he is there's no bound man he cannot set free this man demonized with legion of a host of demons they thought he was powerful, but one command, they were gone. They had to leave. That's our God. That's our, there's nothing that bind, bound that cannot be set free by Jesus. That's really what God is declaring. Let me ask you, are you bound in anything? It's not just told us, I'm not demonized, but you know what? We are influenced. We have a lot of things telling us a lot we are buying into. We are giving ourselves into the darkness. The things are holding us back. It can be, can be form of a addiction. It can be form of a, you know, the depression, whatever it might be. Are you bound in anything? Do you need to be free from any bondage? He is the Lord God. He is the one who proclaims liberty to the captives, freedom to the prisoner. That's our God. That's our God. That's our God. He's declaring that today. I'm declaring today in the heavenly places. When Christ, Messiah, walks in, darkness has to go. You have no place in this place. Healing comes because He is a Savior. He, the deliverance comes because He's a King, real King. Amen? He is here. He is here. He will set people free. He is our God. Now this is the kicker to everything here. Listen, as the sons and daughters of God, He has given us authority to be what He called us to do what He did. 
He's sending us out to declare freedom captives to the captives. He's sending us out to heal the sick because He's given us authority. That is what it means to be follower of Christ. Because heavenly, heaven, God of heavens, living in us, that's the Christian life. Is that just somebody who just believe? He lives in our being. Let him be fully be what who he is. Let him walk through us. You know, and, and this is our God, our Lord, our Savior. Look at this verse. I, I put it in there. It says Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. This is something I meditate and pray on Tuesdays. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you formerly walked, lived according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working the sons of disobedience. You know what he's saying? And all of us, before we knew Christ, we are living in this world, being influenced by the demons. We, we, are, the world, we are following this world, and this world is dominated, influenced by the demonic things. Without knowing, we are, we are living by that. We are buying into the lies of the enemy. We are buying into the lies of the devil. We are just, we are living in the place. We are influenced. We may not be possessed, but we are being influenced. No longer, no longer. We are called, we are new creation in Christ. No longer we need to know who we are in Christ. This week began with Monday morning, God reminding me to pray. Finally be strong in the Lord in the strength of His might. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. Finally be strong in the Lord in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For we, our struggle is against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take out the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. God reminded me, stand firm. We are people of God. Know who we are before God. Stand in His authority. Not only say no to demonic things, but we actually, we are able to press His light into the world. We have to be light in the world. We have to shine light so that the darkness has to flee. Amen? Amen? Let's sing the praise together. Have, are you abound in anything? Are you, do you need to be free in anything in your life? He is a Messiah. He is the anointed one who came as a deliverer, as our Savior, who sets us free. He said, you shall know the truth, and truth shall set you free. If the Son of God sets you free, you're free indeed. Where the Spirit of God is, there's a freedom. Amen? Our God is here right now. Here, right now. Are you in any bondage? Anything holding you back? Anything holding you back? It could be through bitterness. It could be through unforgiveness. It could be through anger. It can be through different things in our life. The enemy is holding your life. 